Hi, friends, and welcome to 15241 uh, Today Talk, uh, another edition of our Jim Render and Lanny for Terry show. And so glad that uh, so many of you have enjoyed our programs. Thanks for, for being a part of what we're doing. I know we enjoy doing it. Ryan Hujak is our guest today. Ryan is vice president of marketing of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Jim, I think it would be most appropriate if you told everybody how it was that uh, you and Ryan first met well first of all he is an upper st Clair uh resident with the four daughters in our school system but uh the steelers you know very graciously honored me uh after we won 400 games and uh anyhow we wound up in uh, ryan's uh, box uh, for the second half of the game and uh that's how we really met and uh uh, Mark Esper was there that day. Mark Esper is now the Secretary of Defense, and I found out he, he was a uh, uh, Laurel Highlands from Uniontown graduate, and I heard the, he and Ryan were talking. I heard, heard him mention Uniontown, which, you know, caught my attention. And, but we had a nice day, and uh, <clears throat> it was also kind of the coming out party of uh, – uh, Patrick Mahomes from Kansas City. He had a big day against uh, our Steelers, and <clears throat> so uh, enough of me. Why don't you? <laughs> well, let, let well, me let me jump in and say first of all, congratulations to you. I thought was, that was tremendous. That I didn't bring it up because of that. I know that, but uh, it is <laughs> wonderful that you were honored by by the Steelers, uh, is that something that the, the Steelers feel strongly about, honoring high school coaches being a part of the community? Definitely. I, I mean, we were, we were honored to have Coach come and, and spend the time with us. We, we you know, take our responsibility of, of being stewards of the game of football very seriously. And, um, you know, we're all, all of us who, who have played and who work in the business are all former high school students and appreciate the value and, and the lessons we learned and, and whether it's a football field or other sports field as a high school student. So we have, we have a, a, you know, we host the Whippeal championships at Heinz field every year. We have a, a Whippeal champions wall at the stadium, which is a permanent display displaying the, the champions each season at the stadium. Um, a guy that works on our marketing staff, Mike Marchinski, his job, is uh, really solely focused on developing youth football and, and interacting with high school football programs, supporting high school football in our area. So it's a big part of, of really who we are, the community in Western Pennsylvania. And so we take our um, opportunities to honor great coaches, players, uh, try to support programs in need, uh, just generally be a part of the fabric of, of the community, which is a big part of you know, youth, youth and high school sports. You were telling me earlier you're from Detroit, Michigan. How was it? Tell us a little bit how it was that you found your way to Pittsburgh and the Steelers. Yeah, so I, I um, you know, different from a lot of folks I meet here, I moved around quite a bit growing up. My dad's job uh, had us moving from a couple different locations. So um, I was one of those kids that I, I really lived in a different part of the country for every type of school, elementary school in Denver, Colorado, uh, junior high in Chicago, uh, moved to Detroit, Michigan, Northville, Michigan, right outside of Detroit um, uh, for my high school years. Met my wife in, in high school there in Northville, Michigan. Um, had a you know, great time in, in high school there. Went, ended up going to college at University of Toledo in Ohio. Um, during that time, my parents actually moved to Philadelphia and then back to Chicago. Um, so luckily, my wife uh, and I ended up settling in Chicago when my parents were back there. And we lived there for about 17 years before we moved here. So you were the Bears before the Steelers. I was. I was. So I served for, for three sports teams when I was in Chicago. I actually spent um, the first couple years of, of my uh, professional life coaching football in college at Northern Iowa. Um, and then decided to get into the, the business side of sports and took a job with the White Sox. So I worked for the White Sox, the Bulls, and the Bears in that 17-year span in Chicago before we came here. That's pretty impressive uh, Resume. Uh, this show we are uh, taping on the 14th of September. It just so happened that this is the date of the Steelers' first game of the year. Uh, tell us about the challenges for you, Director of Marketing, Vice President of Marketing, 
and what we're dealing with from COVID-19. You know, it's been a, it's understatement to say that it's been an unusual year. It's, it's one where we've just had to learn a lot about being flexible, um, a lot about, you know, really trying to make the best decisions that we can at the time that we're making them based on the information that we have, um, really trying to be upfront in our communications. We've got a lot of constituencies, customers, fans that are interested in learning about our plans and what's happening next. And a lot of times we don't have the, as many answers as we'd like. Um, so we're just trying to, uh, you know, really be as flexible as we can, um, really try to make the best decisions that we can at the time that we're making them. Um, I think it's been a year that, um, you know, looking across the league and seeing the early games, um, thankfully they've gone off very successfully this first weekend. Uh, but again, it's, it's, an un, it's unknown territory in what we're dealing with um, and just trying to be um, prudent and smart, but also in, in many ways try to deliver Steelers fans what they're looking for uh, at any point that we can. So it's been a challenging year for sure. Uh, but we're looking forward to a good season, and I think things will continue to evolve as we move forward. No fans in the stands for Steeler games, pit games for the month of September. Correct. How many home games will that? That'll be two Steeler games. Two home Steelers. Yes, yes. We've got we're on the road this week against the Giants on Monday Night Football tonight, and then we got the Broncos and the Texans in consecutive weeks the next two weekends, and there won't be any fans in our games for those two games. Okay, so anticipating the, the home games, mm -hmm. uh, what are you and your colleagues doing in terms of thinking about how do we, how do we deal with an empty stadium, yeah. PA announcer, music, all yeah. of that? We just put a lot of time into that. It's definitely uh, something we've never dealt with before. We've, we've had an opportunity to, to get a few practices in, uh, while our team is doing scrimmages, so we've practiced it. Uh, we're going to be able to gather some information uh, from the games this weekend, and, and tonight we're on the road. Um, it'll definitely be different. Um, there are some league-wide standards. Um, the league has provided for uh, an ambient crowd noise soundtrack for all stadiums to play. Um, for, for buildings that will have no fans, it will be eerily quiet. So they've created a, basically a crowd noise, kind of a buzz of a crowd that is a, a kind of a baseline level of noise so that the voices don't travel and the cadence doesn't travel and things of that nature. And then we'll be able to play music on top of that at certain decibel levels, but all NFL stadiums are governed by the same decibel levels uh, so as to control teams from you know, really manipulating the noise to affect one team over the other. So we'll do that. Uh, it's a, basically a standard operation. We'll run many of our normal uh, video features and things of that nature just because it's normal to do so in the stadium but not having the crowd there and uh, not playing to that energy is going to definitely be a different challenge for us so we're we're expecting to learn a lot from our first game and and I'm sure things will evolve as we move forward um, I'd like to ask about the uh, the fact that camp was held at, yeah. at the stadium how, yeah. how did and they used multiple locker rooms and mm -hmm. whatever how did that work out uh, overall it worked out very well I think that the the funny part about it is um, a lot of our coaches because they don't spend a lot of time at the stadium um, they spend more time at the south side facility or in, in Latrobe it was their first opportunity to really see some of the other areas of the stadium they used <laughs> the club levels the suites they used we use the PNC Champions Club for dining so um, they used some of the hallway areas to create you know, some of the uh, weight rooms and things of that nature. So we really spread out across the building, and it really ended up being an ideal location for the team to be able to come in, spend their entire day, get all their work done, film work, meetings. Um, you know, the meetings being socially distanced, they need a lot more space. So they used, you know, big club spaces for uh, spread out team meetings, and they really used a lot of facilities, not just the football facilities, but a lot of the the fan facilities that you normally wouldn't use. Right. So it ended up being an ideal location for us, and I think our team was very happy with it. I know that the Steelers have changed the grass after the WPIL game mm -hmm. for the second. Now, how did the grass hold up during camp? It held up very well. I mean, we, we have replaced some of it. I don't know if you noticed from watching the pit game, there was a, we, we do a normal replacement where some of it gets worn typically between the hashes. We'll replace those areas first because they tend to get most worn. Right. Uh, but Jimmy Sacco and team do a great job. Our turf has been really excellent throughout the year, and they have a, you know, essentially a plan that monitors the performance of the grass. Certainly weather issues change it, things of that nature. But um, they'll identify different opportunities to switch out portions or all of it whenever necessary and then make those decisions as we go. But I, I fully expect the turf to be in great shape 
um, it held up very well for training camp, and it'll be ready to go for the regular season. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how you spend most of your time as far as marketing and whatever? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the, 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 the business lines that I work most on are, are revenue generating business lines, ticket sales, suites, and sponsorships. Um, on the marketing side, I spend a good deal of time with our event marketing group. Um, our content marketing group, which are the people that manage our website, all of our programming, our social media, yeah. and all those things. Um, and then we have, you know, folks that really work on all of our communications and fan engagement. So really, it's, it's uh, I've got great, a great team uh, that we've been able to assemble that really is charged with those functional areas of the business. And, and my work is really um, trying to organize around, make sure those people are working well together, making sure that all that's synchronized. Um, and then certainly working with some of the bigger picture elements like league interface and, and policies and things of that nature. So I get, I get the opportunity to work with a lot of people and on a lot of our functional business lines. Um, so my each day is usually very different and very busy. That's good. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, a lot of, there's a lot of variety, a lot of different folks to, to work with, a lot of different challenges, a lot of different opportunities um, through working, you know, really in, the, in what has become – um, you know, sports marketing has become, um, you know, a pretty big business. We work with a lot of the top companies in, in Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania, really some of the top country, co companies in the country who really want to connect with Steeler fans through what we can offer. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time interfacing with those companies as well. Who makes a decision on when you're going to create a new jersey or a new uniform that you're going to wear? That would be Art Rooney II. Yeah, I mean that that Art Art is uh, our team president and owner. He's very involved. Um, he he um, certainly takes counsel from a lot of folks, but um, you know our uniform is one of those things that that um, really I w is an ownership decision. I mean that that's that's such an important part of our tradition and and, and part of our history. And, and those things are um, you know uh, have a lot of implications just in terms of how our fans view that and, and there's a lot of long range uh, implications to, to uniform development and uniform really maintaining the traditions and the, and um, all the value in our current uniform. So, um, you know, art primarily would be the one who would, who would be driving most of those decisions. How much are you involved in the decisions relating to the rights of your broadcast partners uh, radio, local television, KDK with the pregame shows mm -hmm. and with, with, the, uh, with the networks. Very involved. Um, very involved in all the local, um, the local arrangements. So we have a partnership on the radio side with iHeart Media, which is the uh, WDVE and 970. Um, and they're kind of sister stations. Um, so we work very closely with them. We have a 24-7, 365 radio station called Steelers Nation Radio. That's available on the HD station of your of your car, but also on on our all of our digital platforms, mobile app, etc. So we're working very closely with uh, our media partners on the radio side and on the TV side. Our local arrangement, as you mentioned, is with KDK TV. Uh, so working very close with them on all of our programming. Uh, we spend a lot of time. Um, you know, really, we have our own content group, so we produce a lot of our own content. So all the content and videos you see on all of our social channels, all of our digital platforms, um, in, in our stadium, on the video board. Those are all produced by our content group in-house. Um, and then we collaborate with the folks at KDKA to put together our television programs that go out weekly during the season, pre-game, post-game, pre-season games, um, coaches program, week weekend programs. All that is in collaboration with KDKA's production folks and ours. What are the coaches and players required to do when the network is comes in for a game? You know, the 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 regular season games, um, those are actually owned by the league. So I don't spend a lot of time working on our regular season broadcasts. Those are really uh, done at the league level. So all 32 teams are subject to the same uh, scheduling parameters, the same network relationships that are governed by the league. Um, and our public relations f people really handle all the media requests. Um, but so once, you know, once we establish what network our game will be on, then our public relations folks really work with the network to understand, 
you know, what type of access would they want, what type of what players they want for interviews, what do they need to support that broadcast. A lot of that we'll do in advance. Um, a lot of the bios, a lot of the, some of the, the headshots you'll see during broadcast, we'll do that in advance and just deliver that to the networks. Uh, but that's really kind of on a, on a network by network basis that happens throughout the year. We definitely look at things, you know, a Sunday night football broadcast on NBC does look a little different than a one o'clock game on CBS. And so their demands tend to be a little bit um, deeper just in terms of how they're trying to build out that broadcast. But all in all, it's a pretty normal schedule that we manage. Well, along that same line, are, is Mike Tomlin required to meet with the broadcasters like the day before the game? You know, I don't know what coaches' rules are. I do know that there are media requirements, and I think that um, I don't know the specifics of how often or, or, or when he has to do that, but he does have a regular media schedule. They established that at the beginning of the year. Uh, coaches, as you know, are, are habitual people, and they want to be on a schedule. So um, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and Coach Tom was very much that way. So I don't, I don't uh, manage his schedule, or I don't know what his obligations are specifically, but um, you know, there are some minimum requirements that teams are able, you know, are required to, to commit to and to support the broadcast. Well, you mentioned the Sunday night. Uh, uh, Chris Collinsworth quite often says, <clears throat> When I met with the coach yesterday mm -hmm. or something like that. <clears throat> so I was just wondering if that was a... They have pre-production meetings. Yeah. So they'll bring in coaches and, and they'll usually do that at the hotel or somewhere where the teams are staying. You know, this, this year is a lot different though. Um, you know, they're, they're, the access and those normal in-person interviews, I don't know how much you watched yesterday, but a lot of those interviews were done virtually. Um, you know, the access to players and the number of people that the players are going to come in contact with this year is going to be much different um, than it has been in years past. Um, even NFL sideline reporters are not going to be on the field this year. They're going to be in the first row of the seats. So they're really trying to limit the number of people that our players come in contact with to create kind of that bubble that you saw around the NBA players to, to make sure that we can continue to play the season and keep our players safe. Speaking of the NBA, uh, I noticed, and you mentioned that you work for the Bulls. Mm -hmm. So my question is, <clears throat> did you watch the Michael Jordan uh, series? About, of course. And uh, uh, tell me a little bit about the accuracy. Or were you there during some... I, I was not there, uh, unfortunately, when MJ was playing. Um, I was there for some really bad years, Tim Floyd, Baby Bulls years. So I really learned how to sell and market <laughs> in that environment. But, uh, you know, I was around and around the organization, around some of the people uh, certainly that were involved, Jerry Reinsdorf and Jerry Krause and uh, John Paxson and some of those folks that were around. And a lot of the, my, my counterparts had worked during those years with the Bulls. Um, you know, Michael... Um, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to spend a lot of time with him. I met him a couple of times in passing. Um, you know, I, I, for all accounts, I think it was accurate. Now, the one thing about that, the, the last dance, is that um, it was known going into that season that that was their last time together. And all the videographers that had taken you know, all that footage during that season, um, all of that, the approval and the rights to distribute that were all Michael's. So the, the, the reason why it hasn't, hadn't surfaced until that documentary is because Michael wasn't ready for it to be surfaced. So, and that documentary was, I think, planned for, to be released months later. Um, but given the circumstances and understanding that everyone was at home and really searching for you know, great sports content, they decided to move up the distribution and, and they timed that perfectly. That was, that was for, for my family, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm still a Bulls fan to this day. I, I you know, still am a, a big Michael Jordan guy. My kids have heard, my kids play basketball, and I've heard me talk about Michael Jordan incessantly. But for them to be able to go back and see that, we watch that together every Sunday. That was great for us to be able to see, you know, you know see him in action, see, the, see what he did, see what, his, what, his, uh, what he's all about, and, and, and all, the, all the moments he had throughout his career was, was special for me because it's something that I certainly – know and, and, and grew up watching, but my kids didn't. So it was nice to be able to get them caught up to that and, and, and see how Michael Jordan would compare to LeBron James or Steph Curry or someone like that. So that was fun. It was me. great. It was great television. I mean, it really was. Yeah, it was great. Marketing standpoint, there are sports teams who have attendance issues and they're 
dealing with bobbleheads <laughs> or free T-shirt Fridays and fireworks shows. It's uh, attendance has never been a problem for the for the Steelers. But do you feel the need to uh, do that type of marketing from time to time? Well, I, I think it's it's a different type of marketing. I think you know to say that that. You know, because we've sold out for a long period of time, because demand for our tickets remains high, that there's not a need for marketing. I think for, for me, it, you know, I just, I, I'm not built that way. I think that, you know, there's certainly a different type of marketing, right? Depending on where you are in the, in kind of the ticket demand and pricing and where your environment looks like. But as I look at it, you know, my job would be to maintain that ticket demand, maintain those relationships. So, Whereas, you know, someone, you know, a team that's maybe not sold out would be more in proactive marketing out selling new tickets. I look at our job more as, as retention and making sure that those relationships are strong and those people maintain and renew their tickets with us. So certainly a less uh, visible and not as, you know, promotional in nature, but certainly I think the challenge and, and, and the opportunity that we have is still the same in terms of making sure that we retain our clients and customers making sure that that demand for Steelers tickets and that the quality of the experience that we deliver when they go is really, really high and we continue to elevate that experience, that's you know, as big of a challenge as, as any team. And that's how we look at it is not to be complacent, but more just look at it as a different form of marketing. In the, in the time we have left, I want to ask you a little bit about your family. How was it that you and Beth decided to live in Upper St. Clair? You know, that's a great question. You know, I, I had not spent any time in Pittsburgh before um, – you know, doing my research for, for this job when I moved here in 2013. Um, you know, there was, we had a lot of recommendations and things of that nature. We looked, you know, really all over Pittsburgh. Um, but, you know, to be honest with you, I, I really relied upon Beth and her, and her instincts and judgment in terms of doing the research on the community and on the schools. Um, you know, we didn't have a ton of time, you know, as you, as you think about these things that come together, our kids were young, we're trying to find schools. We were moving at the end of summer, trying to get them into a place where we could be settled and get them into school. Um, we just got, I think we got a little bit lucky and found a great, a great home that we like. Um, we're still in the same home and, uh, we found a great community. So um, I give my credit to my wife for doing the research and, and, um, you know, doing her homework and trying to find a great community for us. And, and we're happy with it. She really did. Well, we're, we're quite prejudiced. Uh, Jim and I have both spent a good bit of time in this great community, and I raised my children here, as did, as did Jim. Who made the decision on, on the M for all four of your <laughs> dogs? Who made that decision? That's a funny question. We, we, you know, when, when we had our first child, um, you know, it's funny. My first preference for a name was Morgan. And my wife's first preference for her name was Madeline. So you see who, who won out. My first child's name is Madeline. And then when we had our second, we went to my first choice, which is Morgan. Um, at that point, we, we kind of felt like we were, we're on that path. And then I think my wife's next name, her, her next choice was Meredith. She liked that, Meredith. Um, and then by the time we got to our fourth, we, we really couldn't not go to an M. I think we'd be, we'd be doing Mia a disservice if we went to something else. So we, <laughs> we, at that point, we were looking for M names. So, you know, these things happen for, for a reason. Our kids are, um, you know, I think they're happy with them. Maybe not, but I think, you know, it's, 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 it worked out for us, I think. And your oldest, Madeline, is at Syracuse. She is. She is. Marketing major? She's a sport management major um, at Syracuse. Um, she had a great four years here at Upper St. Clair High School. She Played was a sports year? She was a soccer player. Uh, she was a captain as a senior. Uh, all Whippy old soccer player last year as a senior. So she had a great, great time. Did a great job. Um, got a great education. Um, you know, she's, she's doing well at Syracuse. I would say it's, it's not a normal circumstance to be a college freshman. Um, with the pandemic and all the restrictions, but she's hanging in there. She's doing well. Uh, Morgan's a sophomore. Morgan's a sophomore at Upper St. Clair. Playing sports? She is. She's playing soccer right now, and she plays lacrosse. She unfortunately missed her, her first lacrosse season last spring, so she's looking forward to doing that, but she's in fall soccer right now. Yeah, doing well. And Meredith and Mia are both in Fort Couch. They are. Yep, eighth and seventh grade. Yep. Yeah, both basketball players, and, and, and I'm lucky enough to be their travel basketball coach here in Upper St. Clair, so we're enjoying that and, and all that's coming with those busy winters, but it's been great. I guess the four girls is why Beth never interviewed the high school football coach. She, <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't worried about that. <laughs> how did, how did, uh, how did uh, Maddie uh, pick Syracuse? 
was there other schools in contention? Or? There were, yeah, there were. She she came down to to a, a tough decision. Um, you know, Michigan circled the back back around a little bit later in the process. There was a few others on her consideration set. I think what really attracted to her was the major. There, Syracuse is a really great uh, sport management program and a great journalism school. And Maddie is is um, really done some. I think some neat things with her writing and her public speaking. So I think it was a really great fit for her. Uh, she always wanted that, that, um, you know, that big college experience with the, with the division one sports and all the atmosphere and the energy and Syracuse was a great fit. And, and uh, my only stipulation was I was hoping that they would, she would stay within a, a reasonable ride, right? A half a day's drive. And so she's just on the edges of that at about five and a half hours <laughs> to Syracuse. So, but uh, <clears throat> we dropped her off about a month ago and, and, um, Heart wrenching, isn't it? Oh you my goodness! Your, your first child off in college? Yes, sir. Yes, I mean it was it was much more so than I thought it would be. Um, you know, Maddie is is uh, through the whole process of of quarantine and the pandemic. We we thankfully got to spend a lot of time with her, uh, a lot of family meals, a lot of extra time that I don't think we otherwise would have. So we're very fortunate we were able to spend the last few months of, of her at home. You know, just a lot of a lot of time. You know, she would eat dinner with us and she's walking the dog with us and working out at home on the Peloton bike and just being, you know, just really being involved. It's great to have her in that uh, so close to us in that environment. And then, you know, now she's at school, we, we hear from her daily, you know, we're, we're FaceTiming all the time and text messaging and staying very close. And she's, the schedule is going to be, they'll be home for Thanksgiving and then they'll be home through the, through the holiday and then going back after the first of the year. So we'll have a nice long uh, time with her at home here coming up in, in November. Tell her as an old Ohio boy, I'm glad she didn't <clears throat> wind up in Ann Arbor. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Syracuse, is, Syracuse is all right. Yeah, she, she's happy with it so far. She's really going to start to get involved in, in their athletic department and start to volunteer. I think she caught the bug a little bit through my career and being involved and being able to go to a lot of games and, and uh, you know being able to be so connected to the teams that I've worked for. I think it's been gonna kind of built in her DNA a little bit too so I could see her doing something similar to what I'm doing. Uh, do all four, when under normal circumstances, when take for example last fall when the Steelers played a home game, is that uh, that understood that the whole family is going to go to the game, or or are your daughters finding out that when the Steelers are home or they're playing football, they've got other things they've got to do? Yeah, they never go to the game. Uh, they always have soccer, or they rarely go to the game. I'm usually able to take them to the preseason games because it's before those things start. Um, but our family typically is is got you know their own obligations soccer over here basketball over here you know they're always doing something so they rarely go to the regular season games although Maddie my senior now that she could drive she was able to work out and and come down and she went to a lot of games last year so as they get older and and they can manage their schedule a little bit better uh, through high school sports that she's been able to come but my, my family as a whole rarely rarely comes to the games I, I know I wanted to ask you uh, the, um, uh, Back to the marketing aspect of your job for a moment. When a player gets his gets his name associated with a cereal mm -hmm. through Giant Eagle, is that your job to line that up? It's not. No. So so, you know, my job is to is to align the Steelers brand. So you know, when Pepsi associates with us or some of the other brands are using the Steelers marks in in the community, that is that is my job, and our, our team does that. The players themselves. They own the rights to their own likeness. So Troy Palomalo and, and uh, Head and Shoulders Shampoo, that, that did, Troy did that on his own with his own marketing agent. I typically will interface with their marketing agent. Um, you know, if, if that player wants to wear his jersey or identify the Steelers along with that brand, then we would have to get involved. But the player himself, he, he, can, have, he can go do his own kind of marketing arrangements. Cam Hayward has a number of arrangements in the community where he's appearing in commercials and has relationships you know, Ben does the same thing. You know, we, we can be involved from a supporting element. We can help and facilitate those, those introductions. But the, what the player arranges with a, with a brand on his own is, is, you know, fully his right to do so. And, and, and um, you know, they can negotiate freely with however they want to represent themselves and really what the, you know, what the compensation would be. Well, I don't know. I'm obviously a little biased, but it's really been fun having you here today. And, uh, of course, the whole Pittsburgh community is interested in the Steelers. So uh, I appreciate you coming in today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, oh, it's been fun. It's been great, huh, Lanny? It's been tremendous. I, um, uh, I'm glad to hear that, uh, that 
that your four daughters, your wife and your four daughters are are uh, <coughs> loving living in Upper St. Clair. It is uh, really an outstanding, outstanding community. I know we're both proud to have had part of our have our children be a part of, of this great community. So thank you very much. Pre- Don't look for any more jobs. You've moved enough. <laughs> you stay right here in Pittsburgh. I feel pretty good about it. I like it here. I like right, it here right. a lot. Thanks thank you very me. much for joining us. 15241 Today Talk. Uh, Ryan Huzjak has uh, been our guest today. And uh, our producer director is Glenn Ward. Our coordinating producer is Linda Dudzinski. And we thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>